everyone. Very happy, very excited to have all of you here joining us again. This is our monthly community meetup for Threat Modeling Connect. For those who are new, Threat Modeling Connect is a global open community dedicated fully to Threat Modeling. Threat Modeling is everything that we talk about. Um, and today, very, very excited to have Simone, John, and Ken from on the open the open group to share their latest developments in a recent uh, analysis risk management framework called Open Fair. They just recently um, launched a couple of new exciting updates, and we are super honored to have them you know, sharing what's in this new updates and how does that look like and what it means for threat modeling. Very excited to have that first update to be sharing with our community. So, without further ado, let me. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Over to you. John. Please introduce yourself. Perfect. Thank you, Simone, and thank you, Shining, and thank you, everyone, for having us here today. Um, I am John Linford. I am with the Open Group. I am our Security Portfolio Forum Director, uh, so I'm responsible for our Security Forum, our Open Trusted Technology Forum, and the Assured Dependability Work Group. Uh, the Open Group itself is a global consortium of more than now 900 member organizations, uh, we enable the achievement of business objectives through technology standards. We are an open, neutral, uh, vendor-neutral, technology-neutral standards organization. We're going to be talking today specifically about our open, fair body of knowledge and standards, uh, but we also do enterprise architecture. Uh, we have an open footprint forum uh, that's looking at standardizing a data platform for carbon emissions, uh, and we do a bunch more stuff besides. Thank you. Ken? All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ken St. Cyr, and uh, I am a senior architect at Microsoft. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I've been there for going on 20 years this year. So I am an old timer at Microsoft. I've been in the security space pretty much my entire career, spent a lot of time uh, in the identity portion of security for many, many years. Um, you may have come across some of my material. I've written a couple of books, uh, primarily for Cybex Wiley. Um, I've had various security identity series running in uh, Windows IT Pro Magazine, Redmond Magazine, various other publications over the years. Um, and I do a lot of uh, teaching internally in Microsoft. So uh, I am uh, known for a series of protocol analysis deep dives <laughs> that I do within the company. We won't go that deep today. Uh, and also have done um, some events ho hosted by Forrester, um, IT Pro Connection, say, and some other uh, forums as well. Uh, one thing that's not on the slide I'll just quickly mention is I am also a retro YouTuber. I run a channel called What's Ken Making? So feel free to look me up there. And my LinkedIn contact info is here as well. So feel free to connect with me. Thank you. And um, nice to be here. I'm uh, happy to meet you all. I'm Simone Curzi. I've been uh, with Microsoft for 24 years, uh, uh, different roles. Uh, uh, I am a speaker at various uh, conferences and events. Uh, uh, I have authored a, a book on uh, application security uh, on Azure with Michael Howard and Annika Gantenbein, uh, various papers, uh, uh, and also I'm uh, an author of a, a threat modeling tool. So with this, uh, I will leave to Ken, please. All right. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to kind of set the context here of what we're going to do today. So uh, we're really going to break this down into three pieces. Uh, we're going to talk about first the why. So why do we need to uh, incorporate OpenFAIR into threat modeling? Uh, then we're going to talk about what OpenFAIR actually is. Uh, and then we'll circle back. And we'll talk about what it actually looks like uh, when we combine threat modeling with OpenFair and how we can achieve that. All right, so I'm going to kick us off here with, uh, with the why. Thanks for advancing the slide, Simone. Um, so I, I've done quite a, quite a bit of work in the quantitative risk analysis space. Um, and one of the things I like to do is to kind of uh, make a corollary of this to something that's more tangible. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, you know, I was thinking through this and I thought, you know, what if, what if we took the way that we do cybersecurity improvement investments in a, within, within an organization and we apply that same methodology to renovating a home? 
right? So you know how this goes. You, you, know, you find a house that you want to renovate, something that shows promise. Um, so that's on the, the, the house on the far left of the slide here, um, which you know, honestly doesn't look too far off from where a lot of our infrastructure and IT environments are that we're threat modeling, right? Um, once we find that house, what we might do is, um, is walk through it and make a list of everything that's broken and wrong that needs to be fixed. Uh, and we often do that in our cybersecurity space as well. And threat modeling is one way for us to identify uh, what's wrong. Uh, but then if we're going to renovate this home like we make a cybersecurity investment, then what we would do is tackle the lowest value, easiest stuff on the list first. And what we would end up with is something like on the right of this slide, which um, honestly, you know, the question is, would you live in this home? Uh, the ceiling's still broken, there's cracks in the walls, the window's still broken, it might be cleaned up a little bit, um, but would you live in this home? Probably not, at least if you could help it. Um, what if you had millions of dollars of assets to secure? Would you put those assets in this home? No, probably not. I mean, someone can just reach around the window and open it up and go right in, right? This isn't a secure place for your assets. Uh, can you go ahead and go to the next slide, Simone? Um, so one of the ways uh, that we can identify what's wrong and kind of where threat modeling fits into this picture uh, is with, with threat modeling. And I think we all pretty much know what threat modeling is, um, at least most of us probably on this call. Uh, but you know, I like the way that the threat modeling manifesto has this summed up. Um, can you go ahead and click through it, please, Simone? So we analyze representations of a system. Okay, so we're looking at the, the systems itself that need to be analyzed. And we ask a series of questions, and these are all really good questions. What are we working on? In other words, what's the system doing? What can go wrong with the system? What are we going to do about it to fix what could go wrong? And did we do a good enough job on that? And from the perspective of the threat modeler, these are all really good things that we, we really need to know. Go ahead and next slide, please, Simone. Um, and in order to answer these questions, we have a really good approach, right? We, we take the re representation of the system and we go through it piece by piece and we find the interactions that cause threat events. And once we have those threat events identified, we can then attach mitigations to them. And sometimes those mitigations are already accounted for. And other times uh, those mitigations need to have something implemented or configured in order to implement those mitigations. Um, now, is here's the question, is the system secure when the threat model is done? And I think you all should be shaking your head. No, absolutely not. The threat model identifies what should happen. It doesn't solve the actual problems that we've uncovered during the threat model. Um, now, can an organization start implementing the solution right right away after the threat model is complete? Uh, and the answer is not necessarily. Um, oftentimes, these improvements are gonna take time and money. And as we know, organizations don't have unlimited amounts of time or money. So oftentimes, we have to interact with our organization's business decision maker. And the BDM is, is going to have questions also. And their list of questions is going to be different than the list of questions that we're trying to answer as threat modelers. Uh, the BDM is trying to answer questions like, uh, how severe is the situation? In other words, is it severe enough to justify investing a million dollars into improving the security of the situation? Uh, the BDM also wants to know how, how long before this is implemented? Like, when can I go to production? Um, you know, what, and, and you know, what, not only what are the uh, mitigations, which the threat modeler provides, but in which order do I need to implement those mitigations? And especially given that I have a finite pool of money, where should that money go for each of these mitigations? How do I know that this mitigation that I'm spending $10 million to put in place is going to adequately reduce my risk? And these are all things that we don't answer as threat modelers, but our BDMs need to know this in order to implement the mitigations that we're recommending. Simone, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to you to talk about the way that we do this right now. Absolutely, thank you very much. And uh, right now we use something like uh, a 
like this. It's an ETH map, an ETH map uh, which allows uh, to decompose uh, uh, the issues and to evaluate uh, the likelihood of uh, the threat to happen, its impact. And then uh, we define uh, uh, where we are based on uh, some estimation related to the likelihood of the threat uh, and the impact. The problem is that uh, this mechanism is not precise. It allows us uh, to determine, for example, like in this scenario, like in this case, that uh, the severity is medium. And then we decide what to do. In some cases, we may decide even to accept the, the risk, to accept the loss without doing anything because it's a medium severity issue. But the problem is that uh, even if we have uh, um, uh, different values, those values may bring to the same evaluation. So you see in other scenario where we have different values of likelihood and impact, and still we are in a medium severity situation. But if we have such a difference, significant difference between the two scenarios, where the first one will imply a potential loss in the order of $20 million, while the second one would imply loss of $200,000, outcomes, the decisions that we may want to make will be very different. And really, in this case, we may decide that, that scenario B is acceptable not to do anything, while for scenario A, if we had the opportunity to get the, an evaluation about the numbers, we may decide that uh, it's still so important to require some actions from our side but the medium classification will not allow to decide. So we need something better. And uh, we need something that would uh, uh, allow to augment the threat modeling activity we have right now. Uh, here, it's very important, you know, threat modeling, uh, is not a single methodology, is not a single process. So we have multiple uh, mechanisms, uh, multiple processes that fall under uh, the, the name of threat modeling. We wanted to identify some uh, minimal characteristics for those uh, threat models. And those are the characteristics that Ken were referring to, the identification of the threats and of the mitigations. And having this threat model, having a threat model done with the, a generic method, methodology, no matter what methodology we have used, we want to add something that would allow to understand much better what are the potential losses and to prioritize, stop prioritizing the investment uh, uh, to mitigate those risks. So this. Uh, role is played by uh, the quantitative uh, risk analysis and open fair. We, uh, when we have identified open fair, we have tried to cover with it three different very important uh, scenarios, in important needs, I will say. The first one is uh, the ability to measure the current risk. So measurability, that's a, that's a key concept. Right now, we have seen that uh, the approach uh, based on uh, the um, uh, heath maps has a significant shortcomings, but uh, what if we can measure the loss in monetary terms? So this would be uh, extremely important, given a system and generate the threat model and then analyze uh, the threat model as a whole uh, using open fair. And, uh, this will represent for us a baseline. We will see that this could be uh, a, a reference also for the other scenarios. The second one, the second uh, scenario, the second uh, goal that we want to achieve by adding open fair to uh, the picture is uh, optimizing, optimizing uh, the mitigations. So when we threat model, we identify multiple options activities that can be done to reduce the risk. 
but uh, you know when you implement the mitigation you may have a single a second mitigation insisting on the same threat and uh, you will have diminishing returns so do you still have uh, the need for the second one or the cost would uh, be higher than the benefit we want to optimize we want to answer this question we wanted to identify the set of mitigations that will allow to have the lowest cost possible for the organization and uh, this is how we um, determine what needs to be changed and uh, this single aspect uh, makes uh, security at this point uh, linking threat modeling with open fair as an invaluable tool for the business because they can really save money with security if they use this approach and third measured improvements we have all uh, uh, we are all working on projects uh, they are ongoing and uh, the unfortunate reality is that security is often something that is added at the end what if we could uh, measure the effect of uh, security or the lack of security what if we could use the first approach to take a snapshot for example uh, after sprint three of uh, a project and then uh, say, uh, measure again taking another snapshot after sprint five and then compare the results and say look the analysis loss expectancy that we would have after the the, the first uh, uh, evaluation is lower than what we have with the second so essentially we are increasing the potential losses we are doing a bad job with the security losses are increasing and therefore we need more security the, the idea is to have a KTI for security based on those aspects and uh, to measure uh, in a demonstrable way uh, the return uh, the value of security and and uh, how you can uh, have a return on the security investment and with that i will leave to john to introduce oh. open fair thank you simone and i'll actually have you back up just once that that arrow goes away hopefully maybe it will Anyway, all right, so what we're looking at here is the open FAIR risk taxonomy. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, FAIR is the factor analysis of information risk. Uh, it's a standard from the open group, both the risk analysis standard and the risk taxonomy standard. Uh, I will specify just right from the beginning, it is analysis, it is not assessment, it is not management. So it's going to fit into the assessment procedures that you have or the management program that your organization has. It is just that quantitative piece of it to allow you to consistently compare that before and after state. Uh, within Open Fair, we define risk specifically as being the probable frequency and probable magnitude of future loss. Each of the terms that we're looking at here in this uh, in the risk tree do also have very precise definitions as well. I won't go through them in much detail. I'll kind of walk through them as we go through our example. Uh, but the critical part there is that we've now got a common language for speaking both amongst ourselves and with our business decision makers. So when one person has a concern, you're able to think about, okay, is this a threat event or is this actually a loss that we have experienced? Is this a vulnerability that we can address or is it just a, you know, maybe we should have a control in place to address this. It allows you to have those conversations in the same language knowing that you both know what the other is talking about, which is really important, especially for terms like risk that are used in so many different ways. There are a couple of key things that we need to consider when using uh, the open fair analysis approach. And the first is that, as I've kind of been alluding to, we can't measure what we don't understand. So open fair provides that process to identify who is the stakeholder that you're talking about, what are the assets that we're trying to secure, and what is the chain of events that lead to a loss impacting that asset and actually manifesting. So now we know when we're going to go looking for data, what kind of data we're going to go looking for and where we might find it. And there's a lot of really good sources out there now. We're seeing great work coming out of the Scientia Institute. 
Uh, I know that CIRA, our Society of Information Risk Analysts, has a really active community for sort of sharing some of that information. Uh, and the FAIR Institute as well has been recently publishing some really good research in this topic too. Another really critical part of Open Fair is that we go from the top down. We only go to the level of depth needed to answer the question that we have been asked. So we're going to gear this toward our business decision maker and the concern or the problem that we're trying to solve and that the threat modeling process is aiding. So if we know that we're not going to be implementing a mitigation for contact frequency, we don't need to go looking for data at that level. We can stay up one level and get to threat event frequency and make this a much more streamlined process. On the other hand, if we do need to get down to that level, we've now thought through why we need those data and have the rationale for what we're going to go looking for so that when we're asked later, why'd you go there? We've documented why and how. Another really key component of this is that we're going to rely upon objective data. In the case where we don't have really good industry reports or really good documented data on uh, the size of losses or the frequency of them, you know, we've now got things like EPSS that we look at the last 30 days of actual exploits for a specific vulnerability. We can rely on subject matter experts and guide them through a calibrated estimate process which means that for all of these actually, even if we do have objective data, we're going to be relying on ranges for these estimates. So we're going to be looking at a minimum, a most likely, and a maximum, which will also aid in communicating with your business decision maker. If they only care about the worst case scenario, you know that you can look at those maximum data. If they want a full scope of what the possibilities are though, you're also going to have that ready. And of course, throughout this entire process, you have been documenting the rationale for what data you went looking for, where they came from, and what assumptions that you've made for why data outside of your organization are applicable to the scenarios that you're analyzing. Uh, and Simone, if you could advance. So that arrow's meant to show that top-down approach. Perfect. All right. So now for a bit of an example, and we're going to have a few slides kind of building through uh, the Open Fair Risk Analysis Spreadsheet tool. I'll quickly note that this tool is not meant to be robust. It is meant to be a learning tool. So download it for free, break it, delete it, and download it again. It's just meant to help you kind of get your head around the process and seeing how things change. Uh, Simone, if you could click next. We're looking at here, just for some context, all of our lost units are going to be measured in here thousands of dollars. If you could click again, Simone. Uh, we're looking at total risk, but you also have the ability to display this as a single total loss, or you could look at your secondary loss. And you also have the ability both to increase the number of trials because this relies on Monte Carlo simulation, uh, but also to look through those trials and see how your results might vary. In this case as well, the slide that we're looking at here, we are looking at our 95th percentile of losses. So we're looking at 2.5% below, 2.5% above. OpenFair does recommend using a 90th percentile, but you can tighten that up or expand it out depending on what you're actually wanting to look at. Finally, then here, we can look at the chance that a loss will exceed, in this case, uh, $5,000, and we see a probability based on the initial data that we've got in here of 98%, it's going to be more than $5,000. All right. Yep, into the next slide, please, Simone. Cool. Good. So now what this is showing is that we do have the ability to start going through the risk tree and capturing data in different parts of it. So in this case, we're looking at our loss event frequency, so how often a loss is actually occurring in your organization. We know that we want to get below our threat event frequency, and here we see that we've shifted the, uh, the figure to look at events rather than magnitude. So we're now looking at numbers and frequency. Uh, if you could keep clicking for me, Simone. So we've drilled down into our threat event frequency. So how often does that threat agent try to cause a loss to happen? And then getting down into our contact frequency and probability of action and being able to capture both the before or the current state and our proposed change or our after we've implemented this combination of mitigations. So we've gotten down to this lower level specifically because the mitigation combination that we're looking at is going to be impacting at this lower level. 
So we can see with contact frequency, uh, we have reduced uh, expected frequencies for both minimum, maximum, and most likely for contact frequency, as well as our probability of action. So the combination of controls that we're implementing have both reduced the amount of times that your threat agent can come in contact with the relevant asset, but is also reducing the probability that they act against your asset once they get to it. For vulnerability, then, we're looking at what is the strength of the controls around your asset compared to the ability of the threat agent to actually get to it. And here again, we're seeing that the combination of mitigations we've implemented are improving your asset's ability to resist the threat agent, so our vulnerability is reducing. Here we see more consistently with how the open fair body of knowledge recommends that 90th percentile, and we can also see our exceedance curve there. So really useful tools to have when presenting to your business decision maker, showing the before and after where those losses are going to be shifting to. Uh, we now have fewer losses that are occurring as a result of the mitigations that we put in place. On the other side, then, we have the magnitude of the losses. There's still probably going to be some that sneak through. Threat agents learn and evolve. We don't necessarily fix absolutely everything. We've got to prioritize where we're spending. So we're back again to the magnitude, so the, the volume of that loss. And OpenFair categorizes this into primary loss, the direct result of the asset being breached or compromised, and our secondary loss, the fallout or additional repercussions that happen as a result of that initial loss. All of these still in the context of that primary stakeholder, your business decision maker. OpenFair categorizes losses into six main categories with productivity, replacement, and response occurring most often as a primary loss and response, reputation, competitive advantage, and fines and judgments losses occurring most often as secondary losses, though either can happen for either side. And here we're saying that the mitigations that we've implemented have both reduced how often we're expecting to experience a loss, but also the volume or the size of that loss when it does still occur. So now we're looking at uh, this farthest right red circle for that average loss, if that's what your decision maker wants to see. We went from our current state before we implemented anything uh, of about $165,000 in losses per year as a result of this down to $70,600 $70, of losses for that year as an annualized value. So we can definitely show, you know, if we spent less than $95,000 on these improvements, we have a good return on investment. We've improved, we've spent money in such a way that we have lost less than we have spent. We have a good return on security investment. Thank you. Uh, now uh, I have uh, a past demo I can uh, show you. Essentially, we have seen the how we can perform uh, uh, quanti some quantitative risk analysis uh, and uh, using open fair and uh, for sure it's uh, clear that the process to decompose uh, the potential losses to its constituent is not easy you must uh, get the information related to those uh, attack scenarios and you you must uh, get uh, the uh, information related to the probability uh, and the impact uh, of the, those uh, attack scenarios to happen. So this may take some time. And we asked ourselves, how can we address, uh, analyze a threat model? Uh, in typical threat models uh, that we do, in particular, if we are relying on automation, we have a significant number of threat events that are generated. Here in this uh, Excel file, which just simulates uh, how we could proceed, we see that uh, we have a 200 uh, threat event that uh, have been generated by uh, performing some threat model. Um, that, that's a number like anyone, uh, any other number. Unfortunately, it's not enough to define, to identify the threat events. We must uh, determine additional um information we must attach that to them uh, additional information for example and uh, in the interception of data in transit could be done uh, by 
uh, some uh, malicious actor, could be a script kiddie, could be uh, a, a cyber criminal uh, um, or national state, depending on uh, who the attacker is and its motivation, we may have different type of losses, different amount of losses. In some cases, the losses may be even negligible. In other situations, may be huge. So uh, we we should uh, identify work not only with the threat events, but what with what we call scenarios. And the scenarios uh, are multiplying the number of cases that we must analyze. So now the idea is that we have a population, a very population of cases we must analyze is 600. And uh, look, the, the uh, performing a, a open fair analysis uh, may take hours. If you have the information, uh, it may take uh, um, less than one hour, perhaps half an hour, 15 minutes. But if you already have all the information, but still, if the numbers are 600 the different scenarios, it's unmanageable, the cost will be too high. So the idea and the attempt of this initiative is how can we get, uh, analyze something simpler? Yes, we may not achieve a complete, uh, like the, the, the full vision about the potential losses, but at least the order of magnitude. That's our intent. Uh, what you see here, is uh, an example of such approach. The idea is to use uh, a, a statistical approach to this problem. We have 600 potential scenarios. Let's pick randomly a few of them. You see here that we have sampled randomly out of those 600, just 10 different scenarios. And then we perform uh, open fair on, on all of them. And here you see, some values that uh, have been uh, achieved, have been calculated. In particular, the mean, the mean loss uh, for each one of them. This is random, do not put too much uh, meaning on, on that. But the idea is that uh, if you can uh, determine the average loss you will face for each of those uh, scenarios we, you have picked, you can apply statistics determine the loss of the overall population, the range of the loss for the overall population with a 99% of confidence. And this allows to estimate the loss, the overall loss that we will have for the overall population based on this analysis. Now, that's the result that we need, at least to represent, to address the first approach, the first goal that we have put upon ourselves. So returning to the deck. Okay, and we have explain this live demo. Uh, those are the good news for you. First, we are publishing a series of uh, blog posts on uh, the uh, open group site. Uh, and th those are four blog posts and that describe uh, the ideas in uh, much uh, uh, in, in much more in depth than than we had the opportunity to do today. So if you're interested, please go here and get a look. The first uh, has been published and, and uh, already, and I guess that the second uh, should be published pretty soon. Is that right, John? Yep, it should be published any day now. Okay, perfect. Thank We've you. got two more coming after that. And yes, it's already prepared, uh, just uh, publishing it. And uh, we are open. We are actually actively asking for additional help. We wanted to ensure that the process, those ideas are implemented in a way that are usable, that are useful to everyone. So if your team is already part of the open group, uh, uh, please reach out to us, join our uh, work, and collaborate with uh, our initiative. If it is not, if it is not, this may be a great uh, opportunity to join the open group. And also, uh, uh, that this what you have seen uh, may really change how we see, how we look at security, and uh, because 
security can move from being a problem, from being a blocker, to become something that uh, can be demonstrable, uh, can demonstrate value and can uh, save money to the business. And uh, here you, you see uh, a few um, colleagues who have already contributed to this initiative, uh, also previous contributors, and uh, uh, yeah, and that's it. And I think that at this point we can open to discussion. <laughs>